Despite a buffet of diet programs and endless nutritional advice, across North America, rates of obesity, heart disease, and diabetes continue to climb. In his new book, writer and journalist Mark Schatzker finds the explanation for that in our brains and our behavior in a world supersized by food technology. His book is called The End of Craving, Recovering the Lost Wisdom of Eating Well, and it brings Mark Schatzker back to our airwaves from Little Italy in Ontario's capital city. And Mark, it's good to see you again. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. Not at all. Let's just go through some of them here because there's South Beach, there's Atkins, there's Keto, there's, uh, well, I don't have to go through the list. There's so many potential diets on offer. And I guess the, the first and obvious place to start in our discussion is, do any of them work? Well, the fact that you listed so many would suggest that perhaps not. But what's so interesting is our, our continued enthusiasm. You know, every two years, it seems there's a new diet, and we think, this, this must be right. And there's this walk down memory lane. You remember Scarsdale, The Zone. There's a reason, though, it's happening this way, and it's because diets both work and don't work. And here's how it works. All diets, roughly all diets work for about the first six to eight months. You, you know, the pounds start to melt away. You, you fit into your old pants again. People stop you in the street and they say, you look great. And then you hit this wall around six months usually, and you swear the scale must be lying. I'm not eating as much what's going on. And it starts to come back. So people say the diet worked, I failed. So they try the same diet again next year, or they try maybe a new diet. So that's why we've been kind of on this yo-yo treadmill of continually dieting. But, but the truth is for most people, they don't work. You say they hit the wall. What technically is the wall? It's their brain. Uh, the brain, this is one of the most interesting things about body weight is that it's regulated by the brain. The same way your brain controls your heartbeat, the same way it controls your body temperature, it controls how much you weigh. And it, it doesn't like when we start to lose weight. That's why we get hungry. That's why we feel fatigued. But it also doesn't like if we weigh too much. When scientists do overfeeding studies, which is to say they put people in a lab and feed them a whole ton of food, they can't stand it. It's so unpleasant that they had to do these first studies in prisons. And even then people would drop out of the study. And, and, but then once they you know, manage to get them fat, when the study ends, the pounds just seem to melt away again. So there's this idea that the brain has a set point. It, it has, you know, knows what, what it wants you to weigh, and it, uh, it's going to make sure that's how much you weigh. This is a thesis that, of course, uh, could put a lot of people out of business. Uh, so I, I'm kind of curious as to what kind of reception you're getting out there for this idea. Well, it's, uh, it, what's so interesting to me is that We've had this endless culture about dieting. The scientists have known this for decades. The early overfeeding studies were done in 1950s, 1960s. Um, but we've almost as though we've chosen to ignore it, that, that we think we can control what we eat the same way you, you know, decide if I'm going to turn my car left, turn my car right, that, that we have executive control over our body weight. And it's just not like that. The reception I'm getting from, from readers is they're like, wow, thanks for making this clear. I had a funny feeling it worked this way. And and now, you know, it, it sheds a lot of light as to how things actually work. Now, you did something very nice in writing this book, and that is you got to go to Italy. You traveled to Italy, and you came back with some uh, most interesting observations about the nature of obesity in the United States compared to Italy. What did you find? Well, Italy is, it's like going down the rabbit hole in Alice in Wonderland. Um, everything we think we know about eating and nutrition doesn't make sense when you travel to Italy. I spent some time in Bologna. That's where we get the word bologna. They call it mortadella, their version. I'd say it's better, but you can actually see these cubes of white fat. They're not afraid of fat in Italy. They're not afraid of carbs. Northern Italy is particularly interesting because they do not eat a Mediterranean diet. It's not olive oil and fish. It's butter. It's cheese. It's pasta. Um, they revere the two nutrients we've been fighting a war against, which is to say fat and carbs, and they weave them together in these ethereal combinations that are so good, the entire world travels to Italy just so I can eat what that guy next to me is eating. They have rules. There's a repository in Bologna of official recipes. Um, they have a golden noodle at the Chamber of Commerce. It, it is the perfect platonic noodle. So you would think if deliciousness and good food is really the enemy, then you'd expect the North Italians to be the plumpest in all the world. And they are just unfathomab unfathomably thin. Uh, the rate of obesity in Canada is 26%, south of the border, 42%. Italy, 8%. It's, it's mind-boggling. It's mind-boggling, and I think we need to follow up and get an explanation. If it's not the Mediterranean diet, what is it? 
Well, you know, I tried to say what is so different about Italy, and what I found is, you know, there was a time when Northern Italy in particular was not so different. If you go back about a little over 100 years ago, both the American South and Northern Italy were suffering from an epidemic of pellagra, much like our obesity epidemic. Um, it was related to nutrition. N nobody knew that at the time. Uh, there was this, you know, rotating cast of experts that pounded their fists on the table, and they said, it's mosquitoes, it's, it's sand flies, it's it's fog. I mean, they had bizarre theories. We eventually learned it was a deficiency of an essential nutrient. This helped shape our understanding of vitamins. The particular vitamin is called niacin or B3. But what's so interesting is how the two cultures responded to it. Um, uh, the Americans passed laws encouraging, essentially making law um, enrichment or fortification, and we followed suit in Canada. We say if you're going to mill a flour, if you're going to make processed carbs, you've got to add B vitamins, niacin, riboflavin, thiamine, iron, which is a mineral. Um, the Italians took a, a bizarre approach, almost seemed steeped in peasant wisdom. They said, you know, poor people should eat rabbit. We should have uh, make bread in communal ovens. They even said people should drink wine, which sounds so strange, but it turns out back then the wines were not as well filtered as they are now, and a lot of the yeast in those wines had niacin. But what's really interesting is just how the two cultures looked at the problem. America said, something's wrong with food, and, and we humans are stupid, we don't know what's good for us, so we got to step in there and fix what's wrong. The Italians saw pellagra as a disease of poverty, and they said the problem is these people don't have the right food. We saw food as the problem, they saw food as the cure. And over a century later, we still see this difference in this basic attitude. We live in fear of food, they embrace it. You make a, a really interesting analogy in the book to gambling, and I'm going to read an excerpt from your book right now and bring that out. Sheldon, if you would, let's have that graphic. Gambling, especially problem gambling, is a lot like obesity in that way. Both are self-destructive, often ruinous forms of pleasure-seeking. Problem gamblers wish they could stop gambling the same way problem eaters wish they could stop eating. The comparisons do not end there. Gambling may be the best window we have into understanding why people eat beyond their needs. Okay, a bunch of things to unpack here. Where did the notion that gambling as a potential analogy to overeating, where did that come from? Well, it's because we see um, similarities when we look at the brain science. Um, the brain science confirms much of what we see in Italy. The, the knock against people with obesity is that they indulge in pleasure too much. Um, and so if you, if you look at the brain from the point of view of pleasure, scientists call it hedonics, there's two circuits. Um, there's what we call, there's the dopamine circuit, which, which fires wanting, it's you know, visceral, it's, it's, it's a desire, at its most intense, it's craving. And then there's this pleasure impact moment, and that's a different part of your brain. It's related, but different. Uh, it's mediated by the opioid neurotransmitters. And that's liking, that's when you put the food in your mouth and it tastes great. And people have always thought the problem with people with obesity, it's that liking part. They put the food in their mouth, they, they don't know when to stop, they, they don't have the good sense to say enough is enough. It's not what the brain science shows us. Like with problem gambling, we see the problem is too much of this dopamine, too much wanting. They see a, a picture of a piece of pizza, a milkshake, they smell that cheeseburger and they are seized by a desire to eat it. When it comes to actual pleasure, if anything, it's blunted. So, so as with problem gamblers, they're not getting a whole lot of enjoyment out of it, but they are seized by a desire to eat that they, that they wish they didn't have. If we intellectually know that, and if we intellectually know that one or two minutes after overindulging on food, we're probably going to forget about how much we enjoyed the taste of it that second, why do we do it? Because it is so strong. Because, um, you know, we can't just spontaneously switch off our desires. They have a profound control over us. They're with us you know, endlessly, they just don't go away. So I think the question we have to ask is, what is it in this world that has changed such that people are experiencing these desires that are really out of sync with their physiological need? And what's the answer to that? Well, I talk about nutri um, nutritive mismatch, um, because what I'm really looking for is how food changed. And it's not fat. It's not carbs. These nutrients haven't changed in millennia. Um, we consume more of them. But what we have to ask is why would the brain change? And it's because for so long, this goes right back to enrichment, we thought the brain was stupid. We thought the appetite comes from the Stone Age. It's a moron. It doesn't know what's good for us. So we have to step in and fix it. And there's so many technologies we have created to change the way food tastes. Some of these are intentional, things like artificial sweeteners or fat replacers. But some of them, things like emulsifiers, stabilizers, modified starches, they 
they have all sorts of uses in food processing that can improve shelf life or make something look better. It won't turn into a puddle when you microwave it. But these change the information your brain is getting about food. The brain is very smart. When you eat, as you taste food, your brain is getting a reading about very, these are the nutrients coming in. But then it does kind of a post-game analysis. And when now, for the first time ever, these don't always match up. Sweetness, you know, from evolution, sweetness was always an indicator of calories. More sweet, more calories. The same with the sensation of fat. But now we've created all these taste sensations that deceive the brain. And how does the brain respond? Well, it's like if you filled your car with gas and it turned out maybe that pump wasn't working, I got, I didn't get any, you know, you'd want to attach another gas tank to your car to make sure I, I don't want to run out. So these new technologies, these artificial sweeteners, these artificial fats, you're telling us they have in fact been designed in order to deceive the brain so we'll consume more. Is that right? Well, they were designed to deceive the brain thinking that the brain was stupid. But if it turns out the brain is smart and it's constantly analyzing what you ate, this isn't such a good idea. So th these, these were all predicated on this idea that the appetite was just sort of this relic from a past that makes no sense and, and we can step in and control things. But the brain is far smarter. It's, it's like a forensic accountant constantly analyzing what we eat. And it responds in ways that seem counterintuitive. But if you understand the brain as kind of a prediction engine that thinks about the future, future based on what it experienced in the past, this response that we see, this elevation and desire to eat, it makes perfect sense. How about fake facts, Mark? What are they? Well, I, I call them fake fats. The industry calls them fat replacers. And what's so interesting about them, th these are the technology that came around in the 1980s when you start to see things like, um, you know, margarine with fewer calories, light salad dressings, light mayonnaise. This gives your brain the sensation of fattiness, which is to say that rich mouth-filling creaminess with fewer calories. If the brain is stupid, what a great idea. Fool that dumb brain. If the brain is smart, Maybe this isn't such a good idea. But what's so interesting about, about fat replacers, fake fats, artificial fats, is that we know so little about them. We know a lot about artificial sweeteners. We know the brand names. They tend to be branded. The fat replacer industry has been very smart. They, they don't want people to know. Uh, if you look at the industry literature, you'll say that it has a clean label. So there's one called Cream Fiber 7000. This is a fat replacer meant to be used in muffins. If you see it on the ingredient panel, it shows up as citrus fiber, which, you know, I mean, that sounds healthy, the roughage that must be good for you. So what's so interesting about fat replacers is this, in, you know, they're in all sorts of food because manufacturers really want to bring that calorie number down on that on that nutritional info panel. So we're eating more and more of them. They show up in, in even regular cream or regular yogurts. Um, and there's been not enough work done on them. And, and so many people are eating them and just don't realize it. How about this? Uh, it, it, you've, you've got to believe that people take vitamins because they think it's contributing to their health. But there is this notion you suggest in your book that they're actually contributing to obesity. Have I got that right? Yes, I know. And I'll be the first to say, like, this sounds totally nuts. This guy's saying vitamins are contributing to obesity. I and mean, what's next? Like spring water, rain. Um, but, but it's very interesting. If you look at the science, the diet that Southerners and Northern Italians were eating was, was well, in the South, it was pork fat grits and molasses, so carbs, fat, and sugar. A very calorically dense diet, yet these people were starving. How could that be? It's because niacin, the B vitamins, they are involved in energy metabolism. Now let's fast forward the clock to about the 1950s and let's look at how we raised pigs. Because back then, farmers wanted to feed their pigs the same stuff. Let's give them lots of corn and let's give them lots of soybeans. They knew that that can really make pigs gain weight quickly. But if you gave them too much of that, they would get sick. They would get a pellagra of their own. Their hair would fall out. They'd, you know, they'd get diarrhea, and then they would die. And that's because they knew this was not a nutritionally complete diet. So they sent the pigs out to pasture where they would eat alfalfa. Um, all our you know, pork used to be pastured pork. The invention of or the discovery of vitamins changed livestock farming forever. We talk about CAFOs, confined feeding. None of this would have been possible without the discovery of vitamins, B vitamins in particular, because that means you can feed your pigs this rocket fuel feed of corn and soy, and you don't have to bother with the alfalfa. You don't have to send them out into the fields. They can just keep consuming this rocket fuel feed. Well, that's how we got pigs to be big and fat really quickly. Turns out we did the same thing to our own processed carbs. And it's not just the enrichment that the government says, you know, is the law. Um, they're in energy drinks. They're in cereals. They, um, companies love to put in vitamins. And there's all these, you know, nutritional, uh, you know, experts all over the web selling you their supplements. Because everyone thinks, you know, vitamins, they got the word vital. They must be healthy. 
Well, there's a class of vitamins that are involved in energy metabolism, and our problem is we're eating too many calories, and to eat too many calories, you also need to have a commensurate level of too many of these B vitamins. Mark, you asked two really simple but profound questions as it relates to the difference between how Italians eat and how Americans eat. And I'll, uh, again, Sheldon, if you wouldn't mind putting this graphic up here. This is the quintessential American question about food. How will this affect my body? This is the quintessential Italian question about food. Is this the best recipe? That's really brilliant. And I wonder how, after having done all the work that you've done, are you any closer to figuring out how we actually can strike the right balance between nutrition and pleasure? Well, I think more of the latter and less of the former, as strange as that sounds. Um, we've been, you know, these expert nutritionists for decades. We talk about carbs, we talk about fat, keto, paleo, insulin, ketosis. We don't really have any clue what we're talking about. The scientists who study this, PhD physiologists, don't understand exactly how this works. And we carry on as though we have this, this brilliance. The Italians uh, never lost faith in the in the purity and goodness of food. And the idea that the pleasure it brings tells you something, tells you something real and important. We, we did not evolve to be nutritionists. We evolved to eat real food. And the sensations and the joy that it brings us, I think, are very important. It sounds crazy. You'd think the Italians, I mean, that doesn't make any sense. They're just loving food, but it's clearly working better. Okay, you ready for my high tight fastball here? Sure. I know there are gonna be people watching this right now looking at you and saying, how much of this, does this guy weigh? Okay, Mark, how much do you weigh? I weigh 171 pounds and I'm six feet tall and one half inch. Okay, so you have no comprehension, obviously, about uh, what it's like to have to lose weight, to be 50 pounds overweight. And for those people who are watching this right now and thinking that about you, what do you want to come back at them with? Well, I want to come back at them with, um, I, I lead a food-obsessed life, but I think it's a very healthy relationship with food. My first book was about steak, and I literally traveled the world eating steak. But what I see continually, it's not just in Italy. Um, if you look at Japan, uh, J the Japanese are as food-obsessed as you can get. South Koreans as well. These are countries that revere their own food traditions. They do not live in fear of food. And the food they eat is so incredibly good. Uh, I see so many people here in such a, a negative relationship with food. They, they see it as a poison. They live in fear of it. And, and it, it, it really is, I think, a good news to think that it does not have to be this way, that you can have a fulfilling, wonderful relationship with food and, and literally not pay a heavy price. The cover of your book has a beautiful piece of delicious chocolate on the cover of it. How often do you indulge in that? Oh, probably once a night. I have a piece of dark chocolate after dinner. Um, I love chocolate. It's, uh, it's, it's like a gift from God, if, if you believe in God. I'm not a <laughs> believer, but I'd say chocolate's as good of an argument as any. That there, <laughs> there might be a God up there. Uh, can you eat uh, as much chocolate as you want whenever you want? I guess I could, but I don't actually eat that much. Um, what I tend to do, you know what, actually what I've been binging on lately are these clementines, the ones that just come in from Morocco at the beginning of the season. They have this, this tartness that balances with the sweetness. It's one of my favorite times of year is just to eat clementines. Uh, okay. How, I mean, clementines uh, obviously seem, you know, it's fruit. It's got to be good for you, right? Can you, can you basically eat anything you want in moderation? Maybe that's the better follow-up. Yeah, I think you can. I think it's important to look at food. Don't count the calories, count the pleasure. And is the pleasure worth it? You know, you mentioned chocolate and I, and I visited with um, a researcher in Germany. She treats some of Germany's most difficult cases of disordered eating. She has many people, uh, her, her patients suffer from binge eating disorder. They experience these absolute explosive cravings to, to literally eat themselves to the point where it physically hurts. And one of the therapies she has developed is when they get these cravings, she will give them, uh, she says, just eat a fine chocolate. And I went through this therapeutic technique with her, and it's amazing how much pleasure just a small square of chocolate can deliver, and it can actually extinguish this, this explosion of craving. So you don't have to have three Snickers bars in order to feel sated? I would say go for the, go for the better chocolate, yes. <laughs> gotcha. Now, of course, we're on the cusp of um, a time of year when people are typically encouraged, invited, and so on to, to overindulge, do whatever they want when it comes to eating. How do we, in which case, let's take your advice, how do we train our brains to avoid unhealthy food and not to overindulge and to deal with our cravings in a more intelligent way? What's the secret? Well, 
you know, it, the holidays are interesting. You know, this idea of feasting and, and and enjoying food together, we see that in healthy food culture. So I, I think there's a lot that's right about the holidays. We cook from scratch. We cook together. We eat together. It's what we do afterwards. And I think if people want to really change the way, you, you know, if you think that the appetite kind of has a mind of its own, how do you change its mind? I think staying away from so many of these, these tricks, um, things that are like low fat and light, the, the fake sweeteners, essentially processed food, because that's what we do when we process food is, is we change the way it sort of communicates with your brain. Eat wholesome food, but but make it an experience of pleasure. Be like the Italians. Say, is this the best recipe? Enjoy the pleasure that food gets, gives you. It's 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 doing more than just giving you pleasure. It's, it's telling you something important about it. Terrific. We'll keep that admonition in the back of our heads as uh, the holiday season approaches. In the meantime, uh, we are happy to remind people that Mark Schatzker's latest is called The End of Craving, Recovering the Lost Wisdom of Eating Well with a beautiful piece of chocolate that I just want to grab right now on the cover of the book. Mark, thanks for coming on to TVO tonight. Be well. Thank you so much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.